Clev, cheers, salute. The beer I brought is one that you've probably seen many a time. Gold Star. Anything Gold you want to tell us about this this Hebrew beer? Well, it's a very holy beer. Uh, of course, uh, God's blessing is upon it. So if you drink it, you'll be healthy. <laughs> so it is where we say the chayim. The chayim. Gesundheit. Yeah. <laughs> You know, this is like the greatest thing, stuff your pockets with cash. I wouldn't say you're a tool, tool. Did you just pet the goldfish? No! No! Oh, come on! Ryan's guest today is Kalev Myers, a lawyer, philanthropist, and civic leader in Jerusalem, Israel. Wow, somebody get that guy a beer. Did they make kosher beer? How would you describe the, the, the tones of this beer? You know, this is uh, Gold Star is kind of like a traditional Israeli beer, um, and probably our most well-known, well, most sold beer. Um, it's a little sweet to my taste. Yeah. I'd say it would be like a, a pilsner on the sweet side. So, so in America, we sort of laugh at the mass-produced American beers. Oh, they're not real beers. They're not this, you know, cool beer. Is, do, do Israelis laugh at this beer? Is this seen as like the uh, not cool beer in Israel? To a certain extent, yes. Yeah. But, but we don't expect tourists to be cool, so it's okay if you drink it. <laughs> I am cool. I'm the coolest tourist this country has ever seen. Yes, I am. So then, tell, tell us about your organization. It's pretty cool. Uh, I have an organization called the Jerusalem Institute of Justice, which is probably what you're referring to. And it exists to, to advance civil rights and human rights in this region. We're a unique organization. There's a lot of Palestinian organizations that are complaining about the Israelis. There are Israeli organizations that are complaining about Palestinians. We firmly believe that we should make every effort to improve the life of both peoples on both sides of the country. Uh, I believe that both were created in God's image and have the highest inherent value on their lives. And for that reason, we challenge the Israeli government to make Israel a freer society, and we challenge the Palestinian Authority to make their society freer. And you're a Jew. I am. You are. I plead guilty. Have you ever had like the long curly things coming down here? Because I'm seeing like I'm seeing the nose and some other things. Like, you ever had this curly things? No, I never had. Never had this. Like, what, what are the curly I, I, I things? Had, I had a, I had a Jew for a while back in the day. I had pretty curly hair back when I had hair. All right, all right. So you know, in America, we are quite frankly, most of us Americans are entirely confused about the situation in Israel. We hear Palestine. We hear Arab. We hear Muslim. We hear Jew. Uh, West Bank, Gaza Strip. Could you give like um? Just, just give like a cliff note version of what exactly is the political climate. Most people in this land just want to live their life a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, go, go to go uh, and to, to work and provide for their families and get an education and, and 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 live in peace. I think much of the the conflict comes more at the leadership level and and the geopolitical level in the Middle East in general regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Israeli-Palestinian conflict muffins. It really comes down to religious conflict. The idea of a Jewish state in the Middle East, which is also the birthplace of Islam, is unacceptable to uh, fundamental, fundamental Muslims. And so, uh, to this day, many of the leaders of the states around us uh, deny our very existence, even though Israel has existed since 1948 as an independent, internationally recognized state. But what happened here is that, in the post-World War II era, the United Nations said, okay, we're going to take this land that you now see as the land of Israel and split it between the Arab League and a Jewish state. So half of it we give to the Arabs, half of it we give to the Jews. And at that time, the Jewish leadership said, absolutely, this is great, finally we have a state. So what you see in the West Bank, that was controlled by Jordan still, and Egypt controlled the Gaza Strip until we were attacked again by five nations in 1967 in the Six Day War. We won that war in six days, that's why it's called that. And Fascinating, we, six day war. Six yeah. day. The creativity of you Jews is amazing. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's unbelievable. And, did uh, you prescribe, you could, did you say, we're gonna call this the six day war, or did you just figure that out after the fact? Well, it's just, it was kind of catchy, and I think, <laughs> I think I think Israelis were kind of proud that this we, we finished the war in six days, right? So we, anyway, that's how we commemorate that. Good. Um, in the Six Day War, we ended up taking over control of the West Bank from Jordan and the Gaza Strip from Egypt. 
Gaza is not so complicated anymore. Gaza is, is the, the, the strip of, along the southern border of Israel, the Mediterranean Sea, and we completely withdrew all Jewish uh, citizens from Gaza in 2006. So today, Gaza is 99.9% .9 Muslim. Uh, the West Bank is much more complicated because the West Bank is Jewish settlements next to next to Palestinian villages and so on and so forth. The, the far right in Israel says, this is the land of Israel. We should annex it. We should give citizenship to all those Palestinians there and just call it Israel. Palestinians say, no, we need to remove all the Jews from these territories and create an independent Palestinian state. And that's really why we call it the disputed territories. And that, that's what the conflict is about right now. Even in these areas, like I said, in the West Bank, we have the Jewish and the Israeli uh, uh, and the Palestinians living side by side. There's actually peaceful coexistence. Yeah. Israel is an extremely safe place. I think it's one of the safest places in the world, actually. We're here right now, if you haven't figured it out by now, we're actually here in Israel. We're in a fascinating place. We're in a place that used to be the kitchen, the kitchen for Horatio Spafford, who is the person who wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. The believer who came over here and set up a place to, to help people out here in this area. He had awful, awful stuff take place to his life. He lost his daughters, lost his wife in a shipwreck. And this place has become a hotel, the American colony. And right now I brought over a, a group of people and we're touring and, and, and everyone always has the same thing. Like ahead of time, I'm getting all these texts and emails. Oh no, oh no, there might be a, a bomber that comes and kills me. Oh my mother, my mother said that it's not safe, it's not safe. And I tell people all the time like, you're, you're more safe here in Israel than virtually anywhere I can think of in the United States. Now, I see people around with M16s. That's the reason you're safe. Do uh, you think that'd be a big deal? Yeah, yeah I, well, I mean, Israel is a very, where we, 80% of the Israeli population is served in the army, right? We have a people's army, uh, and we have mandatory three-year service for men, two-year service for women, and then men do... Um, reserves at least until the age of 40. So everybody's been trained by the army. So everyone gets their spot to be equal. I tell you, if I was king of the day in America, I would do that immediately. Every American, every American has to be drafted in the military. You're in it for two years. If you, if you can't kill anybody, that's cool. You go to the Peace Corps. But what that would do, and I see it with you and your, your countrymen, is it levels the playing surface. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, no matter what you are, everyone has a common experience for two years. Right. And the country sort of is harmonious that way. Right. And also makes us a very safe country. Because if, God forbid, somebody, you know, a knife wielding individual runs into a crowd, people are trained and know what to do about it. They react quickly. Instead of running away from the problem, they run to the problem to neutralize the, the threat. And usually in, the, in those kind of situations, the perpetrator is the one who's killed in, in, in general. And so it's very different from most Western societies. If you know, somebody yell, yells Allah Akbar in a mall somewhere in France, it's like everybody just flees, you know what I mean? Screams and runs away. Here it's quite the opposite. We, we run to the problem, so what can we do to... Really? Yeah, that, that, that's... We have the same thing in America. The active shooter thing is just huge. So you're saying like when we have an active shooting incident in America, we're similar, we run, we're actually taught that way, yeah. to run, get away, because there's some, there's some real wisdom there. If you stick around and hunker down, you make a shot. But you're saying the instinctual thing with your country, because you've been through two years of military training, is yeah. people run to the problem? Absolutely. What can we do to take care of the situation? Oh, man. So Americans so, run then, you're saying? You're saying us Americans run, and Americans. you Jews are like, <laughs> really, you Jews are more manly than, proud to be an American! Proud to be an American! Proud to be an American! Where at least I know I'm free! <laughs> That's what you're trying to tell us, huh? Look, uh, at least those I'm, of you who've cut your curls off. I'm, <laughs> I'm still a dual citizen, so I'm uh, happy to be American and happy to be Israeli, and I'm not busting on anybody. But what I'm saying is we're, we're, we're a safe society. Uh, I'm always impressed when I come here, as is everyone who comes over with me, that you've got Jews and Muslims side by side in the old city of Jerusalem and other places. They may not be like loving each other, saying, hey, it's great to see you again, but the level of peacefulness and respect um, with the, or the Jews, Muslims, and Christians in this powder keg environment is really astounding. It's actually, it's actually 
more peaceful and respectful than if a couple different branches of the Baptist church got together. <laughs> you're, the, you're the expert on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, see, in America, like, we love going to war with each other. Like, you know, your theology isn't right. My theology is better. You're this, you're that. And, and we're supposed to be in the same quote-unquote family, but it's cool to see a lot of civility and respect amongst different religions here in Israel. At least that's what I see. Absolutely. And some of my, my closest neighbors and friends that I deal with on an ongoing basis are Muslims. And uh, I personally believe that we were not doomed to live together, we were destined to live together. Mm. Which means we, we all have something we need to learn from each other. So as a, as a Christian pastor, okay, why, why do you care about Israel? Why are you here? What, what's your connection to Israel? Why is it important for you to be here? I'm here because I love the story of God and I love the truths, the transcendent truths that are in the Bible. And this is where it all went down. This is the scene of the crime. So for me to be here gives me great, great insight into what's actually in the Bible. Things just, they just come alive. And I've wanted to bring people here to experience that. What, what was the most surprising thing to you the first time you came to Israel? Everything is compressed, everything. Uh, all these Bible stories take place in a very small area, which at first time I came over, I thought, man, this is really weird. Like, this is this is my faith, and this place is really not a big deal. <laughs> it's not a big deal. You know, you start thinking, you know, if this if there was a God and he had a son, wouldn't he come to some place like Manhattan or modern day Rome? And you come here, it's like this little like. No offense, but po dunky place relative to the scale of the rest of the world. That was really, really hit me. And then, but then the flip side of that was, okay, but if this stuff all happened here, why is the movement of Jesus, that, that's my faith anyway, not, not talking about wherever you are right now, but to, for my faith, why is the movement of Jesus the most powerful movement the world has ever seen? Ever. It just, it, it struck me like, wow, something really happened here 2,000 years ago for this movement to spread. Um, so I think profound. that's, it is profound for it's me. Profound. So. And I think, I think even within Judaism, you have that aspect of, of believing that, that God chooses very humble things and unexpected people to reveal himself to. I've often thought, you know, that when we, we say in English that he appeared in a burning bush, in Hebrew, a sne boer, it's like a shrub, it's like um uh, a sne is a very, very small, dry shrub in the backside of the desert, and like that's what you decided. Like, why not a flaming palm tree or something much more? Right, it would just catch your attention. But here's a stuttering, broken man on the backside of the desert that meets God in a shrub. You know, and uh, I think I think that's true. I think I think it's because uh, he gets glorified by using simple, little, you know, insignificant people and things, you know, to get his job done. So mm, that's a good word. Yeah. Mm. Well. Wow, you drank that thing faster than me. <laughs> Does he always do that? <laughs>